Our Father in heaven, we bless your name and we thank you for the mercy you've poured out on us to make us your church, the body that's united to Christ, saved through his work on the cross and assured of eternal life through his resurrection from the dead. And you've not only saved us as individuals, but you've made us a people, the people of God. And it's our joy uh, to live not only uh, in fellowship with you, the triune God, but to live in fellowship with one another by the unity that your spirit is making among us. And we know this is a hard-fought unity to preserve because of so many of the winds of the flesh and the world and the devil that would pull in opposite directions. So we pray that you would help us in this course and in this lesson in particular in this hour to think carefully and biblically and please search our hearts with your word uh, and teach us and exhort us and encourage us in the things of you that we would be a people who excel in protecting the unity that your spirit means to make in our midst, especially with regard to these issues of ethnicity and race. We pray that we as a church would be a beacon of light shining in a dark place in this world, that we would bring glory to Christ, that we would, not only by the proclamation of our lips, but by the adornment of our lives together, commend the gospel to the world. We pray in Jesus' name all these things. Amen. Well, we've been in this series exploring these issues of race and ethnicity. We've looked at society, some of the issues that are that at play there, and specifically we've focused, especially in, in the more recent weeks, on the church. And um, this is the last of our nine kind of, we could say, body lessons with regard to kind of the content we're covering. Next week, I'll talk a little bit more about it later, but next week is going to be kind of a conclusion, and we're going to hope to do a little bit of Q&A. So I think Greg solicited some questions from you last week, and I'll kind of redouble that request and say, um, your experience next week will depend on questions that we receive. So if you send good questions, or you just send questions, even quantity will do at this point. <laughs> if you send questions, we'll have some good stuff to talk about. Maybe some topics that are a little thornier that could just be a good kind of, uh, maybe, maybe it was never really convenient to raise your hand and ask in the, in the midst of a lesson here, but it might be a good place to give five or ten minutes to talk about in that context. Uh, please, please don't hesitate to email tim at rivercitygrace.org. That's me. Um, so... <clears throat> We've seen in this series that ethnic diversity is an intentional good in the kingdom of God. It's not accidental. It's part of the design. Uh, the church isn't called to an artificial forced diversity, like things like quotas of different ethnic groups, making sure we have the right amounts of everybody. That's not the point. The point is that um, Christ's redeeming work in the gospel, part of the glory of that is its all nations scope. It is a gospel for all peoples of the world. The gospel is for all different sorts of people across ethnic, which is what the nations mean, but all other sorts of human divisions, generationally different uh, income status and so on. We, we talked about this uh, when y'all talked, I wasn't here, but we as a class collectively talked about this last week, uh, talking about some of the other categories that may tend to divide us where we need to strive to maintain unity with love. Um, and this is what the kingdom of God is supposed to reflect, and this is at the local church level, what the church as an outpost of the kingdom is supposed to reflect. Um, our diversity in the church testifies of the coming kingdom of God, which is a kingdom of grace that does not prefer one kind of person over another. That's kind of the point. It's a kingdom of grace for all kinds of people because no one's natural advantage gets them closer to the kingdom of God. But walking in kingdom diversity at the local church level is not automatic. It doesn't just happen. It doesn't even just happen by simply preaching the gospel. We've talked about that. The gospel is the cornerstone of, of how we walk in these things, but it's not simply declaring the gospel and these things will sort themselves out. It takes careful thought and it takes grace-empowered work on our part. Um, and in recent weeks, we've begun exploring some of the ways forward through the challenges that race and ethnicity present. Um, so today, this is the last of these kind of what are we doing about it, the more kind of constructive, positive, biblical tools for how we, how we think about these things and walk in these things. And we're going to talk about matters of preference and opinion. 
And um, we've said this repeatedly, and it bears saying again here, all of these biblical concepts and tools we're exploring really apply far beyond just matters of race and ethnicity. Really, any kinds of divisions and, and differences between us uh, could, uh, th this would be very applicable. Uh, all sorts of distinctions generate differences in preference, differences in opinion. But again, ethnicity just in, the, in our day, it, because of history and what's going on in society, ethnicity is a particularly challenging area of difference in our church, so it's kind of where we're focusing our application in this series. But we want to first start by looking at preferences in the church. And I want to first talk about where, where does preference show up in the local church? Where does preference show up? Now, first of all, it's important to distinguish. When we talk about preferences, we're not talking about biblically clear priorities for the local church. So I'm not talking about things like faithful biblical preaching. I'm not talking about things like um, qualified elders according to the biblical texts that lay out what kind of man should serve as a pastor elder, like 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. I'm not talking about the elements in our worship that God's word calls us to do, things like preaching and prayer and singing and giving. These aren't matters of preference and opinion. These are clear things that God has called us to. But what I am talking about by preference is the forms that these practices can take. There are countless discretionary decisions that churches make, and individuals within churches are always making, about how we do what we do. It's inescapable that these decisions at a certain level will start to reflect preferences. It's inescapable. And now we might ask, okay, well, where does ethnicity come into this equation? Well, one of the byproducts of ethnic and racial segregation in churches, which we've discussed in the past, there's a deep historical legacy of that. Churches tend to be pretty segregated ethnically. One of the byproducts of that is that uh, different ethnic church cultures have developed. And some of these preferential issues will differ based on different uh, kind of ethnic cultures as they've been expressed in different church traditions. So these, these different kind of church traditions will have different modes of expression in terms of like worship and church life. Again, not talking about the fundamentals of like what we do as a church, but more how it looks as a church. And I'll, we'll give some examples to try to flesh this out. Uh, in fact, let's start with, with uh, a couple of ways this might look. One of them is uh, what we could call aesthetic or artistic choices. Uh, one big question that comes up is, in what musical genre do we sing praise? Um, acoustic guitar and piano may feel very natural to a lot of us, but it's not universal. It's not necessary, uh, necessarily the most natural kind of instrumentation and form of music that, that would appeal or occur to everyone. Similarly, thinking about things like how we dress at church. Uh, different uh, cultures and different kind of ethnic streams of church tradition have different modes of dressing at church. Even things that we might even think of like the decor, the interior decor of our church building might differ according to these things. And um, this brings us to the classic example of a frivolous church disagreement, which is the color of the carpets, right? <laughs> That's always the example we talk about churches bickering over things that don't matter, like what color the carpets are going to be. Um, but preferences can vary in, in terms of all sorts of appearance and aesthetic choices. And in addition to that, we have things like communication and leadership style. So think about um, when pastors, when a pastor is giving counsel in a kind of one-on-one -on -one personal conversation, how forcefully is he pressing? I mean, there's, there's culture in that, kind of how, how he frames his counsel or advice. Um, ethnic culture is one of the factors among many others, because so there's all kinds of other personality dimensions and circumstantial dimensions. Um, preaching styles and tones definitely differ between different kind of ethnic church cultures. Uh, for instance, black preaching tends, if you've listened to black preaching, there's a tendency to be more rhythmic and more kind of uh, dynamic emotionally than maybe what you find here. Um, and, and similar, you even look at how the congregation in the moment of preaching, how is the congregation responding to the preaching? Is the crowd sitting in silence, which is what we tend to have, or is there kind of callbacks? Is there sort of auditory response? Another leadership matter comes to how we identify willingness in a man who potentially could be an elder. Uh, 1 Timothy 
commends uh, the presence of a desire in a man who would serve as an elder. And similarly, in 1 Peter 5, 2, we're told that elders should serve not under compulsion, but willingly. So it's a, an important principle when we think about who are men that the Lord may be calling to the office of elder. We think he should be willing to do it. He should want to do it. But what degree of force do we expect that willingness to have in a potentially qualified man? I've heard this taught as though the pastors of a church should never approach a man and ask him to consider being a pastor or elder, that it should always come from him first. And if, if, the, if the church sort of is asking him to consider it, then, then uh, we're kind of violating this requirement that there's a desire in him. And I would argue that's a very culturally conditioned application of what Paul and Peter give us, that he should be willing to do it. There should be some degree of desire, but that we can fill in the gaps in application with certain cultural norms and expectations. It's not going to look like that everywhere. It's not going to look like that in every ethnic and cultural context. So this is the kind of issue we're talking about, the ways we express our biblical obedience in, in forms in the local church. And uh, in many of these areas, we might think we can escape this by making culturally neutral choices. <laughs> But uh, often, I hope these, uh, these examples kind of illustrate, in a lot of these cases, there is no such option. There's no totally neutral choice that we can make. We're going to decide one way or another. Our music will be of some genre, some form, or another. Um, in addition to some of the things I've laid out, can anyone think of any other ways that preference, and it doesn't necessarily have to be things that you can imagine an ethnic kind of distinction, but just other ways that culture and preference will show up in the forms in which our obedience to Christ will take in the church. Yeah, Matt. Children's children ministry, that kind of stuff. Uh huh. I've seen different uh, congregations that kids act differently than yeah. Yeah, so children's ministry, how kids act, even what maybe what kind of behavior we would expect of children. What? Yeah, yeah. There could be there could be some of that. Yeah. <clears throat> the ways we fellowship together, like yeah. we're all together, like a church barbecue or something, or even just groups of people within the church. Yeah, well, how we fellowship together as a church. There are some church traditions that very highly value sort of like the family meal, and, we, and like every Sunday there's a, there's a meal afterward together. And that, that's a good example, too, where I think there could be where sort of every group recognizes that a certain thing is good, but certain groups will maybe place different uh, weights or priorities on a certain form. So like, oh, we have to, some, some might feel like we have to do this family meal every Sunday because we're a family. And others go, yeah, we, 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 we would enjoy that, but it does, doesn't feel like the same kind of must to every church. So that's a good distinction. Yeah, yeah. Wesley. Um, baptism. Mm -hmm. I have been in churches where every time they did a baptism, it was different. Like one time they'd use the baptistry, the next time they'd go down to the ocean. Okay. After that, they'd go to the pastor's swimming pool. And they'd yeah. Go yeah, I'm glad you weren't talking about, you know, one time they sprinkle, one time they don't. Yeah, no, but you're talking, that would be different. But you're talking about baptism. What kind of body of water are they rightly, you know, immersing, biblical baptism? What, what kind of body of water? There's going to be a different feel in that, you know, if everyone's down by the river or if everyone's just watching it happen here. Yeah, there can definitely be differences there. Yeah, Don. Language. Langu yeah, language, for sure. I mean, that's a very fundamental one. Language is part of culture, and, and there's... Do you mean different different languages, or even within a language, different ways we speak, different vocabulary? Different languages. Yeah, yeah. That's very fundamental, yeah. You could also even say the latter, right, too, just the ways our vocabulary and, and forms of speech. Yeah, Wilson. I think even on, in the way that we speak with one another in, in the different ways, um, I, I think that plays into the culture and, and preferences as well. I, I went to a Korean American church growing up, mm -hmm. and we were always taught, I, I was growing up as a Korean American, uh, to respect those that are older than you, and that carries across traditions. Yeah. Like especially those who are either pastors or uh, older, we would always address them as pastor so and so. Right, right. Mr. so and so, Mrs. so and so. Um, but when I went to a uh, non Asian church, I, I noticed that kids were calling folks that were much older than them like, <laughs> their names. And yeah. That, like, made me really uncomfortable. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's very disrespectful. And um, yeah, just so thinking about those things. Um, Different than what I thought yeah. was kind of mind blowing. That's a really good example. So, I, everyone here, Wilson, and maybe the recording, 
that in a Korean American church there was so we, we almost a biblical principle of honoring the you know honoring those in authority and, and things like that, but the form even verbally what is the what how does that chart onto how we address each other, what what names we use to identify each other, where there was a there was sort of a norm of we all say pastor or Mister, and then first names it's like, how could you be so disrespect you know and and yeah and that's a really good example of of just differences in how we so those are good examples to kind of keep us thinking about the sorts of things that we're dealing with in this in this lesson, <clears throat> and um. As in so many other matters of real life wisdom and application, there are several issues intertangled here that would be, be profitable for us to kind of look at, to kind of pull apart different pieces and look at biblically. Um, so, so what we're going to start by doing is naming some factors that are a part of this equation that we kind of have no control over, just the facts of the matter. And then um, <clears throat> we're going to look at some biblical principles that would... Uh, help us think through these issues, how we deal with p potentially competing preferences. And then we'll go back and look at some practical ways we can move forward with humility regarding these things. And what we'll say is, so we'll look at things we can't control, just the givens of the situation. Then we're going to look at some biblical principles at play. Then we're going to look at some things we can control, some things we can do based on what the Bible tells us. So does that structure kind of make sense? Um, hopefully not too convoluted. So first of all, some things we can't control. <clears throat> first of all, in any group with a, my, a majority and then one or more minority groups, there's always going to be a natural tendency for the majority's preference to become the default. It's just always going to be like, like gravity, right? That the, the, Whatever seems most natural to the biggest group will tend to be what the group does. Um, and what's tricky about this is that often the majority is unaware that this is happening. Because <clears throat> culture and preference are, can be very difficult to perceive from the inside when you're in it. We hear about the illustration of a fish in water. If a fish has lived its whole life in the ocean, it doesn't know what water is. Um, <clears throat> it's only by coming into, and Wilson's story is actually a really helpful example of this. It's only by coming into contact with, with another way of doing things that you become aware that you have a way of doing things. Right? You're like, oh, I, I, th this is just this tacitly assumed thing I never even thought to consider that it was a decision that was being made until I saw somebody else making a different decision. If you've ever spent any length of time in another country, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You go, wow, there's all these things I never even realized were like decisions we make, you know, because it's most normal to us. And then you go somewhere else where they do it differently and you go, oh, wow, I, I never even occurred to me that someone would do that differently. Um, Wilson's story is a great example of that, right? We, in, in a certain church context, we always say pastor so-and-so and I, I would guess, Wilson, that as a kid you never thought um, <clears throat> that that was a decision you were making, right? It, it didn't seem like there was any other way to do it until you see someone else doing it differently. Um, the second kind of fact of the matter is that resource limitations make this reasonable to a certain degree. Um, it's impossible for the whole group to do what everyone wants. There, there's only so much resources. There's only so much opportunity. There's kind of competing space here. If I, 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 and I use the word competing, um, not like that's, well, we'll, hold this, <laughs> we'll get into how, how we view each other and our different preferences. But what I mean is we, all, we have to do something, and we can't do everything. So, um, again, back to the whole music thing. Music leaders can't learn everyone's culturally preferred genres of music and, and sing in that genre, like there could be dozens of different genres that we want, even different ethnic and cultural groups. There's a variety of genres that people like within each one, but uh, it would be unreasonable to expect that at every church, every you know music team is able to accommodate everyone's favorite kind of music. So there are resource limitations that certain choices have to be made that are kind of exclusive. Um, the third given or thing we can't control is we are who we are. So and. and and I don't mean that with apologies. It's just the fact of the matter. As an example, I hope this doesn't shock anyone. I'm a white preacher, okay? <laughs> I, I've always been a part of majority white churches. I've gone to majority white seminaries, uh, both in terms of students and professors. Um, <clears throat> for me, if I were to try to preach in a more typical black church style, it would be artificial. It wouldn't be me. 
Uh, it probably wouldn't benefit anyone because it would be like acting. And it, it's, it's uh, contrary to, I think there's just a sober and good place of just embracing God made us who we are uh, with our history, with our background. And as we talk about dealing with differences, one thing we, we ought not to do is start to become apologetic about who, who we are, who God has created us to be, what kind of family and ethnic background we have and, and church culture background we have. Again, to the degree within this, the, the, uh, within the discretionary matters. I mean, if you come from a church background that has kind of biblically unhealthy elements, hopefully we're growing out of those. But to the degree that we just have differences, we just, we are who we are. And we shouldn't apologize for that. It's just God's providence. So with, with those kind of give-ins or things we can't control in place, we're going to look at some biblical tools for navigating these things. But before we do, I, I just want to open up and say, does anyone have any questions, comments, challenges, anything based on what we've covered so far? Or, yeah, Wesley. Well, I was going to say, I think that's very good to, to have there that, that we are who we are and, and we are in a position where, you know, we live in a particular community that is a majority of one particular ethnic mm-hmm. group. We are here in America. We're not in, uh, you know, South Africa. Mm-hmm. We're not in a different place. So there are certain things that are just endemic to being mm-hmm. in our particular group here. And as as a difference from like the civil rights movement in the 60s or or even some of the issues now where the blaming is the institutional racism mm-hmm. that exists in America, this is not the only game in town, okay? So it's not that we have a, a system here where people have to come through our church in order to a- achieve enlightenment, in order to achieve salvation. Mm-hmm. Uh, they can go to other churches in the neighborhood that have their traditional cultural beliefs already embedded Mm -hmm. in their church because that's why the other people started that church there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how much time do we spend focusing on changing what is natural and what is uh, comfortable for us in this church when that might be something way, way, way down on the line that's maybe only a one or two percent kind of thing Mm -hmm. where we should be dealing with the issues that are like, you know, 15, 20% of the reason why we're not getting new people in mm-hmm. here to, to be able to minister to. Yeah. Wesley, uh, pre your contribution, you brought up a really helpful, I think, tension, if I could frame it that way, um, where, and this is one of the, you know, there, there's this, a lot of challenging issues that, we, that we're walking through here. And one of them is sort of, <clears throat> I guess, uh, a corollary on the point I just made of we are who we are. On the one hand, yeah, we, we can't just chase down everyone's preferences and, and be, uh, you know, be exactly what everyone wants. I would even challenge that paradigm of if we were to go down that road, one of the things that's wrong with that is it's a misconception of what the church is. And we'd be falling into sort of the church as a marketplace competitor, um, which is a very, sadly, I mean, this is kind of the way it is, right, that we're in a religious marketplace uh, because of freedom of religion. We love freedom of religion, but one of the unfortunate byproducts is it can be very easy to look at churches like any, like a, like a business where there's a kind of consumeristic, we, we chase demographics and, and we're chasing market share. The temptation of that is to be, how do, we, how do we shape ourselves to attract people? So that's a danger we need to be aware of. Um, and, and there's a freedom in just recognizing we are, we are who we are in a sense. But on the other hand, of the, the other side of the tension, as we've talked about in the class, diversity within the kingdom of God around the gospel is a good thing that God has designed. And so one thing we, um, there's going to be an inevitability probably of people sorting to church by preference. But there is a degree to which when we're able to come together across different preferences and ethnicities and so on. There's something very good being imaged about the kingdom of God when the local church does that. So on the one hand, we don't want to get into the marketplace mentality of like, how do we attract this little subgroup? How do we attract this little subgroup and bend over backward to be every, you know, in the bad sense, be all things to all men. I know I'm quoting Paul <laughs> in something that is very good. But on the other hand, we don't want to, we, we, we don't want to um, use that as an excuse to not, um, Think through how can we lower the barriers to unity across di- diversity. So that's a tension we're living with, and you know there's not necessarily easy solutions for 
what that's going to look like in the church. But that's a really good issue uh, you bring up. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, let's look at a couple of biblical texts uh, that help inform our, our thinking about this. One of them is uh, 1 Corinthians 13.5. And it's a very brief statement, but it's very powerful. Paul uh, says, love does not insist on its own way. And if you're familiar with 1 Corinthians 13, uh, Paul is listing attributes of Christ-like love, which he's giving as an antidote to the self-seeking habits of the Corinthian church. Um, There's a lot of selfishness in how they're trying to use their spiritual gifts to elevate themselves. He says, love, among many other things, is patient and is kind, etc. It doesn't seek its own way. So let's think a little bit about what's implied in saying that. First is that each of us has our own way, our own desires. And secondly, um, these desires are going to conflict at times with each other. If we all always naturally wanted the same things, there would be no need to say love does not insist on its own way. Um, But there are going to be situations where we can't do what everyone wants. And so there's kind of this inevitable, there's going to be a winner, there's going to be a loser. We could frame it that way, sort of in a fleshly way. Um, what's the way forward? Well, inside each church member, each Christian in this scenario, the flesh is pulling in a certain direction, it's, and it's saying something like this. Why should I be the one to sacrifice? What makes him or her more important than me? If both parties are being pulled in that fleshly direction and are giving into that, uh, and they dig in their heels on my own way, the situation obviously is going to become very ugly. And there's going to be an impasse. And, uh, and uh, that's the kind of situation where church unity is going to be very difficult across ethnic or all other sorts of divisions. Like it's very easy to just go, go separate ways if you're digging in your hills on your own way. Um, but what's God's message to us? Love does not insist on its own way. Love gives in. And that doesn't mean pa- passivity, just giving up because just is kind of becoming passive or Uh, not caring. It's for the specific reason that he said at the heading of this whole thing in verse 4, love is kind. Love is giving. Love is benevolent. And part of the giving uh, impulse and the kindness of love at times is to yield one's own way for the benefit of the other because as Paul said in, in chapter 12 verse 31, this is the more excellent way of love. This is the more excellent way. It's instead of digging your heels on your own way to say, I choose freely to yield my way for you. And the reason for that is because the kingdom of God is a realm where the, pol- the polarity of the world's values get reversed. And what I mean by that is if we look at Mark 10, 42 to 44, Jesus talking about to his disciples about the nature of his kingdom. And of course in Mark, he's trying to get through to them that him being the Messiah and the Christ, the son of man, means he's going to go to the cross. That was the thing they didn't, they didn't see how that connected. And so Mark 10, 42 to 44, Jesus called the disciples to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. That's the worldly kind of direction things run, okay? Those in power lord it over them. They, they, they exercise their authority for their own uh, benefit, their own pleasure. Uh, the, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. So the greatest is the servant of all in the kingdom of God because this is the imitation of Christ's self-lowering grace in the gospel. As he says in the very next verse, 1045, For even the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Another place, if you want to look on your own, where this same, where Jesus' own self-giving and self-lowering in the gospel, to even go to the cross for the sake of others, becomes the basis for our love for one another, is Philippians 2. If you look at Philippians 2, 3 through 8, Paul holds up Christ in his self-humbling example, being God and yet becoming a servant and even obeying to the point of death on a cross. That's the model for looking out, us in the church, looking out for each other's interests and not only our own. So it's the mindset of Christ to look out for the interests of others, elevating them to a level of the same importance of us or even higher. Okay, Christ gave himself as a ransom. So when it comes to competing preferences, the way of love is not just to passively take a loss, 
Uh, Paul's not calling us to apathy and saying, well, I guess I'll just let you win. That could become a very bitter thing. The loving way is a different kind of win because it recognizes a different finishing line. The, the finish line is not getting my preferences anymore. The more excellent way of love is to give my neighbor his or her own way instead of my own. And, of course, we're assuming, I hope it's clear, we're assuming that what the neighbor wants is good for them and is acceptable. Uh, you know, it's, it's pleasing to God. We're not talking about if someone wants to sin, you know, the world kind of likes to define love as unconditional affirmation. We're not talking about that. If someone wants something that's unhealthy for them, it's not loving to go, well, go ahead. We're talking about preferences and opinions or just competing desires for things that in themselves are lawful from God's perspective. The loving way is to give your neighbor what he or she wants. And if both sides, this is a beautiful thing. So I said, if both sides are digging in their heels on their own way, it gets very ugly, very combustible. But let's flip it. If both sides are seeking to the more, seeking the more excellent way of love, uh, not seeking its own, and being like Christ in Philippians 2 and etc. If both of them are turned in that same direction, then we have Romans 12, 10. They're outdoing one another and showing honor. The competition is who can honor the other most. And that's a beautiful thing in the local church uh, among the people of God. So <clears throat> this isn't super advanced stuff. Uh, this is probably very much review for a lot of, a lot of us. But it's a very powerful, profound truths that can really shape the way we relate to one another and the way we think about these like preference issues. So let's apply this now to majority and minority preference issues. So first of all, if you're a person on an area of preference and difference, if you're a person in the minority group, you have an opportunity here. Rather than listening to the fleshly internal monologue that says, and this is what the temptation probably will be for your flesh to say this, here we go again, as always. I'm being expected to give up my preferences and watch as the majority gets, again, what they want, what seems most natural to them, and they don't even realize they're doing it. They're just walking all over me again. It always comes at my or our minority group expense. Now there's a new way to see it. The minority person can instead say, I choose to give yet again. I choose to miss out on my own way because this is the way I can image Christ in love to my brothers and sisters, even if they don't realize that this is happening. On the other hand, the person in the majority has an opportunity here as well. Rather than listening to the, what will the fleshly kind of internal monologue be saying in the, the person in the majority, might say something like this, well, we're the majority, so it's only right and fair that we get our way. It only makes sense that the, you know, the, the, the <clears throat> majority desires and preferences will be expressed in the church. Instead, there's an opportunity to say, it's our privilege to yield our desires and prefer our minority brothers and sisters in love. Sometimes we can do that. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Even if it doesn't make sense from the strict standpoint of fairness, like if you were to say, well, if you were to always say, it's always most logical to do what the, 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 the biggest part of the group wants. Yeah, maybe from a standpoint of fairness that makes the most sense. But the way of love will sometimes say, we choose to yield that right, if we could call it that, out of love for the other. And to underscore a point we've made a few times, especially a couple weeks ago, this is why listening is so important. Because chances are there are numerous ways that, again, our different cultures, subcultures, and particularly thinking about ethnicities, there's probably numerous ways that people aren't getting what they prefer. And the majority can very easily not be aware of, of these at all. So a good way forward, it, it just even appreciating what's happening here, is to get to know people who are different than you and talk to them. Have good, honest conversations and even ask things like, hey, are there any, any ways that we do things at RCG that feel kind of unnatural or uncomfortable to you? Or maybe they did when you were first here. And again, if someone says, I don't like how they, they, they always preach from the Bible. <laughs> it's like, well, <laughs> that's not a matter of preference, right? But... Um, but there's, there's probably a lot of these little, again, these little ways we fill in the gaps with, with culturally defined preferences and we make choices that we don't realize we're doing. There, it could be a really helpful conversation just to get to know people and what they're experiencing. Just go, hey, are, are there any ways that maybe you've been in churches or things feel more natural from your church background that we do differently here? And again, ethnicity is far from the only basis for these differences, but it's, it's an important one. <clears throat> 
Uh, awareness and listening. I was just talking to someone this week who was just underscoring. Just being listened to can be such a way of communicating love. People, if, if someone especially is walking through these things, just have someone willing to hear them talk about this. I mean, we can think, well, what, what can I do about it? You know, listening and caring communicates love very, very profoundly. So that can be a, a good application point. So before we move on and look at our next, our second text, any, any thoughts, reflections, questions? Yeah, Gary. One thing in looking at the minority group or the majority group, I think every individual has preferences yes. of their own that yeah. go beyond any identification with any other group. Mm -hmm. That I, uh, in any church or any environment, we're going to have preferences yeah. that aren't being met. Yeah. That we need to just let right. go. I mean, we, it would it be more if we all. Exactly. We all insisted on our preferences. Exactly. We're, for the sake of this discussion, we're kind of isolating one category. But the fact, and human beings are so complex, right, that we have cultures or ethnic groups, and we, there's one way of kind of looking at how we differ from each other. But, yeah, within each of those, there's so much different diversity based on what kind of church you may have grown up in or what your family's like or just your own personality. I mean, there's, there's limitless ways that, Basically, the, the things that shape what we prefer and what feels like the right way to do things for us. And so these tools, every church member needs to be using these tools all the time, right, to Gary's point. Because we're, we're always not getting exactly what we want in the church. And the temptation, because of this kind of, you know, praise God for religious liberty, but because of this situation we're in where there's this super diverse religious marketplace, and you can almost like, you can almost find a church. And the temptation is, i got to find a church that, matches the, the highest percentage of my preferences. The New Testament model of the church is, is different. It's one of more seeking to go. How can actually the way that we overlook those differences and endure the things that aren't our preferences actually can bring us together in ways that the world can't explain because Christ and his gospel are the thing that, we're, that hold us together. It's a very good word, Gary, that there's, there's so much application for us. Yeah. Um, let's look at the next text, which is 1 Corinthians. It's also 1 Corinthians. It's a little earlier in the book, uh, 10. I, I started with 13.5 because it's just so short and simple. But we're going to look at a text that's a little bit longer, and there's a little more going on. But it's a very similar principle in uh, 1 Corinthians 10.23 through 11.1. Uh, would someone be willing to read that actually for us? 1 Corinthians 10.23 through chapter 11, verse 1. Yeah, Matt. <laughs> All things are lawful, but not, not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered as sacrifice, then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I do not mean your conscience, your conscience, but his. For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all things to do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Thank you. So uh, <clears throat> there's a lot going on in this text, but to kind of give you a brief outline, sort of hover up at a high elevation, look at what's going on. Um, <clears throat> Paul starts in verse 23 by addressing a slogan that the Corinthians have been using, and he's refuting their use of it. Uh, this is what's going on a lot in 1 Corinthians is Paul, it seems like maybe he's responding to a letter that they wrote. So he'll take a snippet of something they said, and then he'll, he'll, he'll have a section where he, talks, he kind of talks through what, why they're wrong <laughs> and corrects them. So he takes this slogan that they've been saying, all things are lawful. In verse 23, uh, he he, he give some quick kind of refutations of the point they've been making. So what's going on is they've been using this saying 
to justify using their Christian liberties. And the issue, as you can tell as we read through, is that there are meat, meats that have been sacrificed to pagan gods, and then it gets sold later. And some Christians are going, well, this is just meat after all. I mean, everything belongs to God. Um, these gods, these, these false gods are, are no real gods. So I'm free. It's lawful for me to go ahead and buy the meat. But some other Christians' conscience is really bothered by that. Like, are we complicit in, in pagan worship? Is this tainted in some way? So uh, the issue is some have been using their liberties uh, in a way they've been insisting on their right, saying, this is lawful to me. I'm entitled to this. And, uh, and it's hurting the consciences of the other believers. So verse 24, Paul, Paul states his counter principle, which is let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. And then in verses 25 to 30, we're not going to look at this blow by blow, but basically 25 to 30, he brings up this problem, the, the specifics, gets into the weeds of this meat sacrifice to idols issue. And what he's showing is on the one hand, yes, it is lawful, strictly speaking, for you to go ahead and eat that meat. But on the other hand, you got to think of the way it might affect your brother's conscience, who, who thinks that that might not be permissible. But then in verses 1031 to 111, he comes back up sort of to the level of principle. So he's kind of descended into the particulars, verse 25 to 30. Then he descends back up to kind of stating principles. And he says in verse 31, the ultimate motive is the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Um, this is what you may be familiar with, the Westminster Shorter Catechism in its very first question. It calls the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him. This 1 Corinthians 10.31 is a very famous verse that we, we may hear quoted a lot as sort of this all of life governing verse, do it for the glory of God. Uh, but it's certainly the strongest force driving how we think through matters like our use of liberties. Now, um, then in verses 10.32 to 11.1, 1, he gives his own practice and he calls his readers to emulate it. Um, he tries to, this is amazing language, especially if you're aware of biblical language elsewhere about the fear of man, the danger of the fear of man, and just kind of doing what other, other people want. But there is a certain sense in which what he says, I try to please everyone. Wow. <laughs> I try to please everyone. Not in the sense of, uh, of being dependent on their approval in a godless way. That's the danger of the fear of man. But what he's saying is he seeks to give no offense by his use of liberties, so that the gospel can go out clearly to both Jews and Gentiles. He's a missionary crossing cultures. So he's saying, I got to be sure that my use of liberties doesn't cause unnecessary offense that would, that would hinder the, the gospel being heard uh, by these different groups. Um, now, the presenting issue we're dealing with in our lesson is not the same issue that Paul's dealing with. He's dealing with, uh, if we could use the, the, the word in verse 33, advantage. He's talking about seeking my own advantage or that of others. The particular advantages that are in view in the text are my liberties as a Christian, things I'm permitted to do versus someone else's conscience. But I would say the same principle with a little bit of adjustment would apply to competing preferences and comforts. If that's the advantage in view is we have competing preferences and comforts uh, between believers. And the same principle though would apply. Strive to give no offense, but rather Seek your neighbor's good instead of your own. It's very similar to what he says about love in chapter 13, verse 5. And in this way, this is what's beautiful. In 11.1, 1, we imitate Christ. Paul is saying, this is what I do, and I'm being like Christ. And I think he's probably thinking of things like Mark 10, where he says, I, gave, I, I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom. And so we imitate Christ, and according to 10.31, we give glory to God when we walk this way as believers. Um, how specifically does it glorify God when the church pursues this practice of seeking the other's advantage, not just our own? Yeah, what's it? Well, I think God is pleased when we try to act like Christ as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So we're just seeing that Christ was out for the advantage of others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it glorifies God. It pleases him when we imitate Christ. Christ, uh, Christ walked in perfect righteousness and perfect obedience to the will of God. And when we as his people in faith seek to, to emulate his example, it's pleasing to God. Absolutely. Yeah, Annalie. Even more than that, like, um, not only is it pleasing to him, but it also reflects good glory to others. Mm -hmm. And 
Absolutely. You know, that's a good point. So there's a certain worldly human way of doing things that's opposite of this, right? Seeking our own advantage, seeking what's lawful, insisting on what I'm allowed to do. And, there's, and when we image Christ by reversing that, we reflect something of God to the world in a way that stands out from the world. And that's, of course, a, such a big part of the design of the church, the holy love of God being put, put on a beacon and displayed to commend the gospel. So, yeah, it definitely it displays the beauty of God. It displays the otherness, the holiness of God from the world when the church walks this way in so many ways. And I want to I wanna bring out two particular implications from this text on our issue. One is it moves us from thinking from the, the limited category of rights to the broader category of people's interests or advantage. Again, using that word advantage from verse 33. So some rights may be, strictly speaking, may be entitled to me, but those rights aren't the only thing that matters. There's a broader context, and that is goods or interests of various people. And uh, it can be very tempting to only focus on what's entitled to me. That's a very human, natural tendency. I think an unfortunate American tendency that we love in the civic realm uh, of our country, but we can accidentally bring to church that we, we really, really care about what's entitled to me. And um, what the danger there is I can overlook the way that my use of my rights may actually compromise the good of others. That's the issue going on in, in Corinth. And so again, the loving way of Christ and of Paul is to give up rights to secure the good of the other. There's a broader set of goods that we're interested in than simply what's entitled to me. Ultimately, and this brings up the second implication, the larger vision for giving up our preferences is the glory of God that's b- being displayed in this otherworldly, others preferring love of his kingdom. Um, so it's, it's, it images God and it shows his goodness to the world when his church looks like this. So any other thoughts about the texts we've looked at? We're going to look, and like I said, we're going to start looking at some things we can do, some things we can control based on these biblical tools and texts. But any other thoughts about 1 Corinthians 10, 23 to 11, 1 um, before we do that? Questions, thoughts? Okay. Well, let's talk about some things we can do. Um, we've seen some inevitable realities of culture and preference in the church. We've reviewed some biblical principles about how Christ-like love equips us to handle these differences. And so let's talk about, I'll, I'll lay out four choices, four things we can do, things that are up to us. Uh, and then we hopefully have some time to throw it open for other ideas. But the first is, and I think this maybe fits under, would fit under the language of giving no offense, striving to give no offense. There are some ways that we can choose expressions that are more subdued and neutral to minimize the alienating effect on the non-majority. And what I, let me give you an example of this. If we did a focus group, again, we're really going down the church marketing track, okay? We want to get big. We want to capture our market share. And we did a focus group and found out what kind of interior decor really, really appeals to college-educated 30-year-old white women. We could do that. You can do that, okay? And we, fig- we could figure out exactly how to set this place up to really appeal to that demographic. But guess what? Uh, it would tend to look, the more we go down that really hyper-specific preference road for one group, it's going to look more and more alienating to other people. There's kind of a natural effect there where the more particularly one group's desires are being met, the further we're probably straying from other, the way other groups would like it. So if you look around at this building, I don't mean this critic. I honestly think it's very good. Um, I think our decor, the way things are set up, and I think this applies to our music. This applies to a lot of aesthetic choices. We try to choose things that are a little bit more neutral and a little bit more likely to be inoffensive to everyone. I don't think, raise your hand if this is the most beautiful building you've ever been in. I'm not criticizing people that worked really hard to build this building and to kind of remodel it a couple of decades ago. <laughs> but it, it's functional, but I think it's actually, it's really good. We're kind of meeting in the middle, so to speak. I, at one point I've said, the church in a, in a way it's kind of like the DMV in that it's, it's not, I don't hopefully mean to the administrative uh, red tape and all that, but what I mean is, it's supposed to serve all kinds of people. And so there's a certain kind of neutrality about it. So if we p- push really hard in, in one group's aesthetic direction, there, we're going to be, be compromising that. And there's going to be some kind of preference, preferentiality that we're going to be 
doing there. So there are some ways we can just try to kind of be neutral. Um, the second thing we can do is that <clears throat> while the majority's desires will tend to be default, there may be instances that we can just choose to, to do a, a minority preferred way of doing things as a way of embracing and loving the individuals that would prefer it. Uh, I'll use an illustration of a family of five that every once in a while they go out and they get a tub of ice cream together and four of them really like um, mint chip and the black sheep of the family likes his favorite is black cherry and uh, when they're buying ice cream together it's logical that most of the time they're going to get mint chip and sorry son it's just majority right we all like this but wouldn't it be every once in a while wouldn't it be a loving thing for the family to just choose to get black cherry wouldn't that be a way of loving that child? Like, what would it communicate if they never, ever, ever got the flavor that that kid likes the best? <clears throat> Again, you could every single time be like, well, it only makes sense that we get what we all like. Sorry, kid. But there's sort of on the whole, there, there can be opportunities to say, you know, you matter too. Um, <clears throat> now, um, when it comes to specific ways we could do this as a church, I don't know of a lot. To be honest, like this is an area, I hope just raising these issues and discussing this, part of the intent of the series is just to get us talking and thinking together. And there could be stuff that arises as we get to know each other better about how this might look. I will give you one illustration of, uh, that I'm aware of of a church doing this. And I do realize this is a bumping into resource limitations thing. I'm not trying to put, I keep using music. I'm not trying to put you, Wilson, or any of the musicians on the spot here or trying to uh, put pressure on anybody. Just an, an example to get us thinking. Uh, there's a church I've heard of that's mostly white, but they sometimes choose to sing hymns from a black church tradition. They have a black church hymnal that they'll use, and they'll get songs out of there and sing them from time to time. Um, even though they're not the most familiar songs to most of the church members, um, and they, they choose songs that have good theology, right? They're not just, just trying to choose based on cultural preference. Of course, they're trying to, trying to uh, pick things that are edifying biblically. But... Um, <clears throat> These songs could really minister to people who have this kind of church tradition in their background. Uh, if you think about, if you grew up in church, the songs you grew up singing have a very special place in your heart. Or even if you didn't grow up, but you've been a Christian for many years. The songs you've sung for years and sang in the early parts of your faith, the early eras of your faith, have a really special place in your heart. And that's something we may not realize. People who come from different church streams, of kind of uh, ethnic and cultural church streams, that's one thing that they may have given up to come to a church where they're not in the majority is they, they, they will never sing those songs that are, that are most precious to them from their own past. So that could be one way we do it, right? Even if it doesn't logically make sense, that song for, for the majority of the people, but it could be a way of loving the minority. Um, are there any other ideas that anyone wants to offer of ways we might do that? Uh, choose a way that might be the preference of a minority. Um, again, not necessarily every time, but the point is just sometimes we just choose to make this choice in love. Any other ideas? Yeah, Ms. Smokey. I think in <clears throat> the arena of music, we're doing that some. Mm -hmm. In that um, <clears throat> some people come from hymn traditions. Yeah. Others come from praise songs. And we mix them. Which yeah. Is a big deal because people are getting old. Obviously, we're not doing organ. Yeah. Um, but we are who we are. No organ here. Yeah. Yeah. And if yeah. we're doing music, that's about as far as yeah. we could go in that um, yeah. learning a gospel style piano. Mama Mia, that would be so hard. It yeah. Would take a long time. Resource limitations. Yeah. yeah. But that's a good point. We have some flexibility, and we are trying to strive to this. This is kind of a generational thing, maybe, or just. Again, it's not always ethnicity. There are different church kind of backgrounds, traditions. Kind of mixing hymnody, some of the older, with some of different eras, some of the newer praise music. Something we're striving intentionally to do under Wilson's leadership has been great. Um, so that's, that's another similar example of the same kind of thing, just trying to be aware of who are the different groups and what, uh, what, what is more meaningful to them. Within the degrees, we have discretion and, and resources to do that. Um, a, third, a third lever we could pull, a third thing we do have some control over is Whatever choices that we make, it would be good for us to be trying to grow in our recognition and appreciation for what other individuals are not getting their preference. Um, and I don't mean we're always just 
you know, we're, we have this demanding where we're always telling each other what we don't like about the church. But as we get to know each other, again, asking questions about what's more natural to is there stuff that's more natural to you in, in certain ways? Just getting to know one another as brothers and sisters, we're going to start growing our awareness of, wow, they, that person's really giving up some things or had to make, had to make some adjustments to, to, for this place to feel like home. And uh, it's, it's, I think it's appropriate to, to respond to that with a certain degree of honor and gratitude to our brothers and sisters that have had to make those maybe a little bit harder uh, of a transition. It's like an office where everybody works in the same office. They all have to, you can't put the office near everyone's house, right? It is where it is. Everyone has to get there. But there's a certain maybe degree of respect. The, the coworker had to drive an hour each way to get there. There's going to be a certain degree of like, wow, I, I really respect that you do that, right? Uh, it doesn't mean we can move the office, but, but at least there's a degree of gratitude that we can have. Uh, and the fourth, the fourth lever or the fourth thing that's available to us is just to be growing in our awareness of the different ways that we're all culturally wired and take it into account. And again, I'll say it again, it's not just ethnicity, there's personality, there's so many dimensions here. But an example, I'm going to go back to this idea of how we identify a man who might be qualified to be an elder. And as we look at the things like desire in, uh, in 1 Timothy 3.1 and in 1 Peter 5.2, um, <coughs> I think it's very wise for us, us as pastor elders and the whole church to look at a man's kind of cultural background and consider, and as we get to know him as an individual, how might that desire, how it might or might not be likely to be expressed. Um, and I'll just say that that desire might look different, might look different in a man of uh, Asian American cultural background than it would in a man of like a more European cultural background. Um, and it would be very unwise to fail to take that kind of thing into account and to have this very this one culturally conditioned mold that we say, if a man's being called to the ministry, it's going to look like this, uh, and not consider that, that the biblical principle might have a variety of, of how it looks in, in practice. Um, so besides those four things, so we can choose more neutral expressions, we can make conscientious choices, uh, in favor of the minority sometimes. We can respect and honor those who are kind of traveling a farther distance, so to speak, in terms of familiarity. And we can just get to know each other and try to, try to uh, take into account how we're wired differently. Um, any other ideas of things we can do? That's cool. We can think about it more. Maybe that's something to reflect on uh, in the, the days to come. Uh, but just maybe other other ways we can we can walk forward w with these things with preference. Yeah, Matt. Maybe I, I'm, I was thinking like maybe uh, I don't want uh, to think what I'm saying better, but maybe like the uh, some of the books and things that we go through as a congregation we can look for. Perspectives there as well. Mm -hmm. um, I know when, when we did the men's group just before COVID started, the, the book we we're going through and the video series was from a diverse mm -hmm. uh, congregation, and I really appreciated that a lot of different perspective there. Yeah, uh, and it was solid. Yeah, so yeah. It's like um, that that did something right. Really help, helpful. So there can be value in just reading a try to be a diversity of who we're reading. Uh, it, it, in all kinds of ways, I mean, but, um, and that, this isn't, that's an example I appreciate, Matt, where I, I've heard this, you know, I've heard, I've heard people advocate that, and then I've heard a response of like, oh, it shouldn't matter what they look like, what matters is reading stuff that's good, and, and I like what you said, Matt, of, well, it was good, it was just also written by someone that was different than, than you, and maybe a lot of people in the group, and there was some benefit in that, so we're not talking about, again, just one-dimensionalizing everything and making everything about ethnicity, that was the danger with critical race theory. We talked about that earlier in the class that everything is about ethnicity and oppression and everything. But we're just more talking about being conscientious to expose ourselves to different perspectives um, within the realm of people who are teaching edifying biblical things. Um, and ethnicity is one of those dimensions. You know, gender can be another one. You know, men, I you should read some women, books written by women sometimes. And, and but it's probably not hard for women to read books written by men. But uh, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of them out there. But anyway, yeah, so there's this value in seeing different perspectives, and reading can be one, one helpful avenue for that. Yeah, Rodney. Uh, 
I'm mentioning it because I don't know which category it fits into. It might be D, account for differences, but uh, so you mentioned choosing a minority way sometimes as a, as a kind of a corporate decision. Mm -hmm. one, I think we've talked about it, but one way to describe it is variety. Yeah. We, we do that with music, right? We don't only do one thing, we do different, so you right. mentioned that. And, and then the ice cream idea, you don't, you don't have to get a tub of ice cream that everybody has to have the same. You could have, you could have different kinds, right? That's true. And so we, we do that with, with music, I think, is a good example. Right, or, right. Or food, obviously, there's, there's kind of options, right? So there's, there's times where just because most people like one right. thing, you don't only have to serve one thing, yeah. you can also provide an option of, of multiple things. So yeah. variety, it kind of fits into accounting for differences, right? You yeah. recognize that everybody isn't the same, so you do things different ways at different right. times. So if there's just an underlying, or just sort of a pervasive striving to striving toward variety within the, the degree we have the resources with things like music and, and food and things like that, uh, where it's more likely that there's less of this kind of systematic overlooking of that kid that likes cherry ice cream, right? If you go out and you just get four tubs of ice cream, right? <laughs> and then everyone, everyone, you have plenty of ice cream for everyone. No. Yeah, but that's, that's good. We have, we have certain ways that we can do a variety of things sort of just as a, as a habit. I don't know that could be helpful. That's good. Yeah, Gary. I'd like to just ask the question then while we're on the neutrality, how, how do you define neutrality or neutral yeah. expressions? Is there, how do you know what's neutral? Yeah, you that's need a, some examples. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do we as a church have to study every example to come up with neutrality? Is this a goal that we should how right, do right. We arrive at this definition of neutrality? What is neutral? Yeah, that's a great question, boy. What is neutral like in terms of cultural expression? But I, I don't know. I think there's some kind of intuitive sense. I, it's certainly not. I don't think it would be a, an appropriate takeaway that we have. We put. Our, we burden ourselves to be experts on every, you know, every dimension of everyone's aesthetic choices. Uh, that's that would be, yeah. That's that would be a, a big stream. But I think there, in some ways, we kind of implicitly see that. Again, I, I use the DMV. Sorry. I, I know we ha we all hate being in the DMV, but I think there are like we've all been in we've all been in spaces that we know were designed to be really cool for certain kind of people, and we've all been in spaces that seem like they were designed to kind of serve everybody, and that's sort of I just mean sort of in the broad sense. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. There are churches, and I'm not trying to I'm not trying to be be really critical of other churches here, but there are churches that have decided we're going to go really hard in this aesthetic direction. To be really attractive to like 25 year olds in a certain kind of ethnic and income demographic and they they make a lot of aesthetic choices that are very appealing to that group and there's certain businesses and things like that where you've probably been to where you've kind of seen that appeal being made um, by certain choices and I would just say there there's all we've also been to places that are kind of you can tell they're trying to serve everyone and I don't know, it's kind of intuitive. I don't really know beyond. That's a great question, yeah. Yeah, David. Do you have a thought? Oh, yeah, some mercy too. Oh, 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 yeah, go ahead, Marcy. Well, I was just going to say, some churches go the other extreme, like there's a modern worship hour versus yeah. a classic worship hour versus, you yeah. know, whatever the next term is. Yeah, and yeah. Classic, I don't know. Yeah. So, like, one's at 9.30 to 10.30, one's 11.30. Yeah, yeah. Noon, so they're trying to... That's such a good point. That that's a temptation too in our in our that that's a tempting outlet for this problem, which is we can have multiple gatherings that give different groups what they want. It's usually age probably that's kind of the, the main appeal there. And the danger of that is it's a short it's a circumventing of, of so much of what the New Testament's vision of the church is, is this a place where we learn to love each other and prefer each other, even though not every song is the genre that we prefer, or maybe none of them are. If we love that organ-based, you know, old school, like we grew up in an Anglican church or something, and like you may, you may be in a church where you're never going to get that. Um, and while we're striving to meet each other and we're striving to each give up our preferences, but yeah, that, I would say that's a, that's a kind of spiritually growth-stunting move for a church. Set aside the issue of multiple gatherings. There's other issues there. But, um, but yeah, like, n no one's going to be forced to grow past a certain point if we just kind of concede that and go, well, we're just going to split by our, our aesthetic preferences. Yeah, that's not, that's not, I don't think that's consistent with the way the 
Bible calls us to as a church. Yeah, David. Maybe it's just Rodney's, you know, ice cream variety that we've taken to extremes. So no, that's not the point I was going to make. Yeah. Um, so two things, two thoughts. One would be that, generally speaking, the closer we cling to Scripture, mm -hmm. the more, by default, things will be unifying universally, right? If somebody yes. comes from anywhere in the world and attends our service, if we're following what Scripture reveals, and they are at their church in another country, there's, there's a unity there. Yes. And then I think that's one of the things our church excels at, where... We, we haven't necessarily intentionally pursued cultural diversity, but because we're trying to cling closely to what scripture teaches, that can be very unifying and cultural yeah. and allow for different cultures to participate. And then the other side, I think more of the one possible critique just to throw out there is the, the bias for blandness. And, and I think you make a good case for that. However, that could be potentially stifling to people who are creative and artistic. Yeah. And I don't know that we provide a lot of outlets for those people. I mean, we don't, we don't, you know, could we let them, you know, do a mural or something like that? Yeah. It's like, are there, are there, I know over in the Ed building, there was some really nice artwork done yeah. over there at times. So like, but do we, the bias for blandness and trying to avoid offending anyone could be stifling some of the more creative types. In, in totally. Our so that's just one. No, that's such a good point. Yeah, I know. Those are both really good points. That, that is. On the one hand, I know you're not saying this. We, there can be an illusion of thinking, as long as we're being biblical, we're not making cultural choices. I know you're not saying that. But on the other hand, if we're, the more we're sticking to Scripture, letting Scripture be our, be our script as a church, the less we're going out on a kind of culturally particular limbs. Because when we, div when we, when we uh, kind of start diverting or start, start straying from Scripture in terms of the mission we give ourselves and the activities we pursue, the direction we stray will be very preferential and cultural and so if we're kind of staying close to the closer and closer to the center we're gonna it's gonna be easier to like if if you grew up if you're used to a black church where the preaching is a, is a very black church style but it's expository preaching and then you come here it's probably going to be a smaller leap to get used to this preaching than if you went to a church that had kind of unbiblical black preaching and you try to go to a church that has unbiblical white preaching if that makes sense. Like, like there's, a, there's, there's a really kind of deep commonality you're going to find if you want biblical preaching, probably across different cultural expressions. The other point, too, and that's a good, boy, there's a, what do we do with that? Is there a place for aesthetics in the church? Is there a place for beauty, uh, like artistic beauty in the church? I hope so. I don't exactly know how that fits, how we, how we do that without um, unintentionally maybe alienating and preferring but anyway that's a good conversation to have how do we what's the place for pursuing artistic beauty in the church and how does that interact with the the the, the mandate to protect unity yeah that's a good yeah gary oh you have the last word here yeah uh, by god's design according to scripture Yeah. Ideas and preferences. Uh, you just come to one of our meetings to yeah. see that. And, uh, um, yeah. But that plays out in kind of the, the fuller expression of how we do church. Yeah. driven there's no way to avoid it's gonna so many ways to start expressing these preferences and so there's a way that the ply of elders uh, can can kind of check each other on the preference level and we're striving together to be biblical in a way that's gonna be helpful to a broader a broader group of interests yeah so good good point um, so we've seen just in this issue that there are inevitable preferential and opinion kind of choices being made in the church and there's some things we, that are just uh, kind of baked into that with being majority and minority uh, and there's an inevitability to that not everyone's going to get what they want all the time actually everyone's going to get what they don't want a lot of the time <laughs> but the bible gives us tools for walking in, in a way that we're not insisting on our own way but we're imitating christ and, and his grace in the gospel of self-giving and we can express that in the way we we endure things that aren't the way we like and we give up things the way we like uh, to, to serve one another
So all kinds of different applications. I hope we just kind of whet your appetite thinking through applications. And there's, Lord willing, more of that we can, we can do together. So let's pray, uh, closing prayer. Father God, we thank you for the glory of the gospel that you saved, you have saved and are saving a people in Christ from every tribe and tongue and nation. And uh, there's nothing about us naturally, there's nothing about uh, the family we come from, the national group or ethnic group we come from, nothing about the st- uh, stratum we're in in, in our, our economic and so, uh, society, nothing about that commends us to you. It's all of grace that in Christ you've brought us to your side, you've forgiven our sins, and you've made us your adopted children. And we pray that uh, just our, our, the humility with which we walk as a church would reflect that in our love for one another and our sensitivity to each other's desires. Uh, may we be a people striving to outdo one another and showing honor in these matters of preference in a way that commends your gospel. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.